For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is author, broadcaster, and award-winning journalist Marina Kantakusino, here to unpack her book titled Forgiveness and Exploration. It was growing global conflict together with hearing a new story about a father forgiving a doctor who had accidentally administered a lethal drug to a three-year-old daughter that led you to found the Forgiveness Project. So can you tell us more about this project? Yes. Well, my background is journalism. And as a journalist, I always knew that the power of the personal narrative. I knew that stories stick in a way that facts fade. So when I was inspired to start the Forgiveness Project, and I was inspired, as you rightly say, partly through an international conflict and partly by seeing this very personal story of forgiveness on television, I then, as a journalist, started collecting stories. And um, that, in the end, became an exhibition called The F Word. But I called it The F Word because it was about forgiveness and it was stories from victims and perpetrators who had transformed their hatred and feelings of revenge into feelings of compassion and empathy. And also I spoke to former perpetrators and offenders who had transformed their aggression into a force for peace. So when that exhibition was so successful, so it was stories, everything about the work that we do uses stories as the tool for change, essentially. I thought to start a non-profit that would carry on the work of this exhibition, which had been so incredibly successful. It was around the time of the Iraq War, and I think these narratives of hope really inspired people to think that there could be another way of responding to violence other than through retaliation. You asked about the work that the Forgiveness Project does. It's now nearly 20 years old. We use these stories in prisons for a programme we call Restore, which encourages prisoners to share their stories. We take the stories into schools. The exhibition has been in so many different places, from shopping malls to schools. It was in the European Union, in Brussels once, you know, very diverse. And we we do podcasts and we just put on events where we discuss and grapple and unpick this difficult subject of forgiveness. And can you also talk to us more on how forgiveness became a lifeline for the Dixons for forgiving the person who murdered their daughters? Yes, I think you're referring to the story that I opened the book with. Wilma Dixon um, and her husband suffered the terrible loss of their daughter being brutally kidnapped first then murdered. And the reason I started with this story in the book is I really wanted to go in what many people would consider a story about forgiving the unforgivable. Because two weeks after she disappeared, the body was found, and on that day, they were pretty sure that something appalling had happened to her, but the confirmation that this was murder came to the parents. Their friends bought food and drink, but also at the door was another man that they'd never met before. And he was also the father of a murdered child. And he wanted to come and tell them just what to expect. And he told them of everything he'd lost, his job, his family, his peace of mind, his health. And they went to bed that night making a vow to forgive. And they hadn't planned to do it. It's just they saw what the father represented to them, everything that might be their future. And they were determined to build a different future. And their whole life was around holding forgiveness in front of them as the direction. And it's not always easy. One day you can forgive, the next day you can hate all over again. But I wanted to use that story because I think they became in many ways um, very famous for forgiving and often criticized. People didn't like it. People were affronted by it. And this is what also often happens. But also, I think it was a very good example of someone who completely transformed the narrative, their narrative. And, and so it seemed a really important story to begin with. And do you think insisting on accountability before forgiveness might cause victims to always be linked to the source of their pain? And can you tell us more about the story of Father Michael Lapsi, who was severely injured in a bomb attack in April 1990? Um, I think to insist on accountability and justice and acknowledgement is absolutely the right of anyone who's been hurt. 
and particularly I think it can happen within political violent settings where you see governments just repeating the harm. Nevertheless, individuals often forgive without any of that because it can be an act of self-healing, self-preservation. And if you're waiting for the accountability, you might be waiting forever. I think it's perfectly feasible, and it happens very often actually, that people do not expect or wait for an apology or accountability because they know it won't happen. And if they keep hoping for it, in a way they're inextricably linked to the person who's harmed them. Now, Father Michael Lapsley, who is a priest working here in South Africa, he lost both his hands. They were blown off when a bomb was sent to him during the apartheid era when he was in exile in Zimbabwe because he was a member of the ANC. And he doesn't forgive. What's really interesting about him, he doesn't forgive, but he is a very peace-loving man and he doesn't carry bitterness in his heart. And people often assume he's forgiven because he's about peace building and he's about healing the wounds, of personal wounds and the wounds of history. That is his goal in life. But he says he hasn't forgiven because he doesn't know who to forgive and that that person would have to repent and change. And that person would have to come to the door and tell him what he's doing now, how he's changed his life or their life around. And then they would earn forgiveness. So he thinks of forgiveness as a, a lame concept unless it is rewarded for him, he's only speaking for himself, unless it is rewarded by somebody having shown accountability or shown remorse, sincere remorse. At the same time, he completely understands those who need to forgive in order to release themselves from the prison of hatred and bitterness. And can you also briefly talk to us more on how South African-born Magdalene Magola's kidnapping in Scotland in December 2008 impacted on her friendships? Yeah, I've, I've used that story also in the book because I was interested by it. Now, she was a South African who came to Scotland to work as a nurse. And the story is bizarre in the sense that a fellow South African who knew a friend of hers came to ask for her help. And in fact, all, what he did was he kidnapped her and attacked her and put her in the boot of his car and parked the car far away where no one would find it, where she lay for nearly a week. In that week, she locked in the boot of the car with no food and no water. And when she was found by police, she was very, very nearly dead. The story that she tells is in, of interest because she found it in her heart to forgive the perpetrator deep disappointment that her fellow countrymen had done this terrible thing to her, but also a recognition and a wanting to understand what has happened to someone that they can hurt someone so immensely. And yet what she found difficult and impossible to forgive was what her friends did afterwards. One sold the story to the newspaper, others talked about it to other media outlets, they used her tragedy and her victimhood as something they could gain from. Now that betrayal of trust and friendship for her was more difficult to forgive than a man who essentially tried to kill her, a stranger who essentially tried to kill her. So I, I use that example just to show everyone's got their own limits, everyone's got their own parameters as to what is forgivable and what isn't, and there is no right and no wrong deeply personal. Can you tell us more on what University of Stellenbosch Professor Pumla Gobodo Matigizela think is the one vital piece missing in reconciliation in South Africa? I was interested when I heard Pumla Gobodo Matigizela speaking at Stellenbosch University in 2014. I'd read her book called A Human Being Died That Night, in which she met Eugene de Kock and had entertained and grappled again with the whole notion of how do you forgive a man who's committed such huge acts of atrocity and violence. And what, what was interested me about when I heard her speak was that she was reframing her thoughts around forgiveness and actually come to the belief that acknowledgement and accountability and apology were actually in many ways more healing because there is something 
extraordinary about witnessing the person who's harmed you deeply shift and change in front of you. Squirm, be humiliated. This is a genuine apology. Um, anguish, show remorse, commitment to change. In a way, once you see the person who's harmed you so greatly, occupy that space. All the slider switches for forgiveness come on because it's a very disarming experience. And what you see is the humanity of the other person. So what she was talking about there was the power of apology, which was something that she had come to after excavating the power of forgiveness. And can you briefly talk to us about the story of a father who couldn't face sitting on a chair next to his son's murderer, Patrick Maggie, who is responsible for planting a Brighton bomb which innocent people had been killed? Yeah, I think you're referring to there an interesting incident I have because, because the Forgiveness Project uh, works with victim and survivors of crime and harm and, and violence and former perpetrators and offenders. Sometimes we bring those people into the same space. And I was putting on an event where I had some speakers. And one of them was the mother who had lost her daughter in a suicide bombing attack on London transport in 2005. And I'd asked her to speak. And I'd also asked a man called Patrick McGee to come and speak, who had planted a bomb years before that. Mm -hmm. Um, to do with the Irish conflict and the bomb had been planted in England and killed five people. So these two events were not connected, but they were both to do with terrorism. One was a victim and one was a perpetrator. So the event was about to start. Patrick, who was the former IRA activist, arrived, but the mother didn't arrive. So I thought she'd been held up on the tube or on the buses. So I carried on the conversation with Patrick. It, it was okay, but it wasn't the same, obviously. And, and after the next day I spoke to her because I couldn't get hold of her. And she said, I couldn't face sitting next to a man who'd done this to um, innocent human beings. And my daughter was innocent too. Um, so this, this woman I was very interested in because she'd been a Christian, vicar in England, and she had held out against forgiveness. She couldn't forgive. And I think that was quite clearly demonstrated in a way but by her not being able to sit in the same room as someone similar to the person who killed her daughter. And lastly, Marina, what does forgiveness mean to you as an individual? I think forgiveness is, you know, like we all want people to behave as we think we behave, and we have standards. In many ways, I think forgiveness is giving up the expectations that people will behave as you want them to be. In other words, it's a softening, um, which is a freeing up. And it's making peace with things that have happened to you, the wrongs that have been done to you that you cannot change. So it's about letting go. It's about acceptance. And another key ingredient is to have some compassion and understanding and empathy for the person who's hurt you. Thanks very much. That was Marina Cantacuzino speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about forgiveness and exploration.